The point at which you stop a set during training is a topic commonly debated in the fitness world, usually revolving around whether sets should be taken to failure. What does the research say? A recent 2020 study by La Serrada and colleagues aimed to determine whether taking sets to failure was essential for maximising hypertrophy. 10 untrained men had one leg assigned to a failure condition, while their other leg was assigned to a non-failure condition. The unilateral leg extension was used to train each leg. Each participant trained 5 times per week for 14 weeks. However, only one leg was trained each workout, meaning that on one week, they would train the failure leg three times, while the non-failure leg was trained twice. But the following week, the non-failure leg was trained three times, whereas the failure leg was trained twice. Over the 14 weeks, this meant that both legs were trained the same amount of times. During weeks one and two, three sets with 50% 1RM was performed for both groups. During weeks three to eight, three sets with 60% 1RM was performed for both groups. During weeks nine to 14, four sets with 60% 1RM was performed for both groups. Also, after the third week, one rep max was retested every two weeks to ensure the accuracy of load. For the leg that trained to failure, as you'd expect, each set was taken to failure. For the leg assigned to the non-failure condition, the total number of reps completed in the last failure leg session was added up and divided by the number of sets performed. This number was then used as the number of reps performed in each set for the non-failure condition. If this confuses you, let me use a hypothetical example. Let's say a participant, during one of the workouts with their failure leg, completed 9 reps on the first set, 7 reps on the second set, and 5 reps on the last set. If we add these numbers up, which is 21, and divide it by the number of sets performed, which is 3, we get 7. So, in the next session for their non-failure leg, 3 sets of 7 reps were completed with that load. This design essentially meant that for all participants, the non-failure leg would have been roughly leaving around 2-3 reps in reserve on the first set, 1-2 reps in reserve in the second set, while the third or fourth set would have been 1-0 reps in reserve. Ultrasound imaging was used to measure cross-sectional area changes in the rectus femoris and vastus lateralis of both legs. What the researchers found was that increases in cross-sectional area for the rectus femoris and vastus lateralis were statistically similar between conditions. Although, the percentages do overall slightly favour the non-failure condition. Something pretty cool about the study was they presented the individual data responses. Four increases in rectus femoris cross-sectional area, four individuals responded better to non-failure training, three individuals responded better to failure training, while the remaining three responded similarly to both conditions. Four increases in vastus lateralis cross-sectional area, four individuals responded better to non-failure training, while the remaining six responded similarly to both conditions. This data highlights the importance of individualization. Some individuals may respond better to failure training, while others may respond better to maintaining a few reps in reserve. Also, some intra-individual variations may exist. That is to say, for a certain individual, some muscles may be more responsive to failure training, while others may be more responsive to keeping a few reps in reserve. Needless to say, knowing this can be quite difficult. But in the long run, through maintaining a training log, experimenting and analysing, you'll definitely gain a greater understanding of what works best for you. When looking at the rest of the research on training to failure, the study detailed in this video seems to summarise it quite well. Overall, training with a few reps in reserve, so around 3 or less, appears to produce similar results to training to failure. As we can see, Studies that have the non-failure training groups using a higher number of reps in reserve, so around 5+, plus, ultimately find training to failure to be better. Although, a study by Carroll and colleagues does disagree with this. Their findings were likely because all subjects perform sprint training twice per week on top of lifting weights. Training to failure is more fatiguing than maintaining reps in reserve. But sprint training and training to failure result in even more fatigue. Therefore, there's a case to be made that the failure group was under-recovering, and it's possible that if neither group was sprint training, the failure group would have superior results. However, a major problem with the current research is there isn't enough research looking at trained individuals. We already know that training responses differ between trained and untrained individuals. 
It's possible trained individuals may on average respond similarly to maintaining a few reps in reserve and training to failure. But it's also possible they respond better to training to failure or even maintaining a few reps in reserve. We unfortunately just don't know at this moment. Moving on, a lot of people actually underestimate the number of reps they can perform. A 2017 study by Hackett and colleagues demonstrated this very idea. 81 adults with a varying training experience performed 5 sets on the chest press with 70% Warner M and 5 sets on the leg press with 80% Warner M. With these loads on these exercises, you can typically perform 20 reps or less. During each set, participants were stopped at the 10th rep and asked how many further reps they think they could achieve. Then the participants immediately went back to performing reps to failure. Looking at the results for the chest press, it's clear to see that participants underestimated the number of reps they could perform. For example, it appears that it was common for individuals to feel they could only perform 5 or 6 more reps, when in actual fact, they could perform 10. This was the same story for the leg press. Surprisingly, training experience didn't actually have much of an effect. This is important, as if you were to train with a few reps in reserve, you might underestimate the actual number of reps you left in reserve. Given this, it might be a good idea to occasionally train to failure, so you consistently remind yourself of how it feels to go to failure, thereby helping to keep you more accountable when you do leave reps in reserve. The context of the particular exercise you are performing may also play a role in determining how close you train to failure. With multi-joint exercises, such as squats and bench presses, maintaining correct form is integral to not only minimise the risk of injury, but to also efficiently train the intended muscles. For some, especially beginners, taking multi-joint movements to failure can result in the breakdown of form, mainly due to fatigue causing a lack of concentration and awareness. Therefore, it may be a good idea to maintain a few reps in reserve with such movements. With single joint exercises, such as bicep curls and tricep skull crushes, there isn't as much of a skill component with them. Therefore, fatigue is likely to have minimal effects on form, and so training to failure is viable with such movements. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, a like would be awesome. Also, let me know how you train. Do you like to keep a few reps in reserve or train to failure? Or do you even do a bit of both? I have lots more videos planned. If you think you'd enjoy my content, subscribing would be appreciated.